This meeting is being recorded. Good morning, everyone. Lots going on this morning. Um, 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 Emily has made pancakes. Oh, I'm making them. She's making them to order following the service, both gluten free and regular pancakes in gluten free are also dairy free. Gluten free are also dairy free in honor of Pashnat Day, so which is on Tuesday. I'll explain an announcement. And That's she'll explain day. an announcement. So mm -hmm. we're glad to see everyone here on this last. Sunday of Lent, which I'll be talking about a little bit this morning. Before. I'm sorry, the last Sunday of Epiphany. Thank you. As we transition into Lent, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. But we're glad to see you all here. And let us now gather our hearts and our minds and our thoughts as we worship together.
please everyone stand. As God called to Moses from the mountain, we are called to be God's people. As Jesus called the disciples to climb to the peak of another mountain, we are called to follow wherever Christ leads us. As the disciples stood in awe at the sound of God's voice, we are called to worship in wonder and praise. join me in the gathering prayer. Light of light, God of all creation, you showed yourself to the disciples in Jesus' transfiguration. Shine in us, around us, and through us, that the world may see your glory in the faces of your people, faces transfigured in the light of your love. Let us confess. Though we want to walk with Moses and see God's holy radiance, we hide in the midst of our own desires, unable to perceive the presence of God's grace. While we want a world of justice and peace, we walk in clouds of selfishness, unable to share God's loving kindness. Though we want to follow Jesus up the mountain, we cower in fear unable to bear the light of God. In the blazing light of God's grace, Jesus touches us to say, get up and do not be afraid. In the name of Christ, all are forgiven. La paz de Dios si contigo. May the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Peace, everyone. <laughs> How? Yes, I do. Ta -da. Peace to all. <laughs> the lord said to moses come up to me on the mountain and wait there and i will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment which i have written for their instruction so Moses set out with his assistant, Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain of God. To the elders, he had said, wait here for us until we come to you again, for Aaron and her are with you. 
Whoever has a dispute may go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. Our psalm this morning is part of Psalm 99 and it is responsive. To God, all people give thanks. Sing praises, all people, to God. God is sovereign. Let the people tremble. God sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. God is great in Zion and is exalted over all the people. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is our God. To God, the people give thanks. Sing praises, O people of God. Mighty sovereign, lover of justice, you have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Extol the Most High, our God. Worship God, holy is our God. To God all people give thanks. Sing praises all people to God. And the gospel reading this morning is the story of the transfiguration in the gospel of Matthew. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Thanks be to God for the good news. Let us pray. God, as we will begin our journey into Lent this week, a time of contemplation and prayer, giving up something or perhaps taking something on, I ask that at this time, the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all of us be acceptable to you, our strength and redeemer. Amen. Every week while I'm working on a sermon, my husband, he says, well, what are you preaching about this week? And I said, it's Transfiguration Sunday. And my husband, if you know, he's a Baptist minister. And he said, oh, no one knows what that is. Now, I know that's not true, but I also know what he meant. Because a lot of people do not know Transfiguration Sunday. They might know Christmas, Easter, maybe even Pentecost. But it's always the last Sunday in Epiphany, Transfiguration. 
Last year, I spoke of the story of transfiguration as an epiphany, a time when God's glorious presence was made known to a few of Jesus' disciples. Jeff, this week is asking us to gather pictures of our thin places for worship next week, and I won't be here. So I think of these thin places as epiphany places, where we catch a glimpse of God in some way. So since I'm not here next week, I'm sharing mine this week. And I have a picture of a lake in Northeast Pennsylvania. And this is my story. My mom's from a big family, 11 children. And my grandmother and several of my aunts and uncles who were single lived all their lives with my grandmother in the house they grew up. And when I was a teenager, my single aunts and uncles, they had a membership in a local swimming and boating club in this beautiful pristine lake that was nearby. There were no motorboats at all allowed on the lake. And there were only a couple of cabins on the lake. It was in the foothills of the Poconos in Pennsylvania. Now, I always had loved this lake when I was able to go. And there was one large cabin where the members could rent sometimes if they won the lottery for that summer. So one week in high school, I was at the cabin and it was gathered with all my aunts and my uncles and cousins. We had all kind of come together for that week. And when we arrived at the cabin, there was this memorial stone that was laid up stood up by a tree near the front door and it had the names of soldiers who had been killed in the region in World War II. And it was all the boys who had attended a Boy Scout camp that was across the lake um, in the 30s and 40s. And for some reason, the stone had been moved across the lake and it was at the cabin. And I don't know if it was done because our family was going to be at the cabin that week because my mom's brothers name was on it because he, along with a lot of other Pennsylvania boys, were killed in a tragic event on a ship called the Leopoldville in the English Channel on Christmas Eve 1944. But as various families began to arrive, the phone rang in the cabin, and then one of my uncles rushed to the car, and my mom said there had been an accident with my grandmother at the house nearby. And what had happened was she had had a heart attack and she died in the house while most of her family was in the cabin and this memorial stone to remember her son who had died, her only son who had died, was there too. So that kind of sealed Greenwood Lake for me as a mystical place. Then a couple of decades later, the summer after my favorite uncle died, the one who had rushed back to when the, my grandmother's house when the phone call arrived, after he died the next summer, I was sure I saw him fishing on the dam breast of the lake, which he had often done when he was alive. That sealed Greenwood Lake for me as a thin place. Now I spent a few days at Greenwood Lake every summer and I recall the couple of epiphanies that I've had at that place. They are anchors I hold on to, they comfort me. And I recall the gifts and the strengths that God has given to my family and my family to me. Now, Transfiguration Sunday marks a transition from Epiphany to Lent. It's always the Sunday before Ash Wednesday, which of course marks the first day of Lent. Along with the glory of God shining on a mountain before Peter and James and John, the story of the Transfiguration, which they were not allowed to tell, until after Jesus' resurrection. The transfiguration takes place at a transitional point in Matthew's gospel. Just before the story of going up to the high mountain, Jesus, for the first time, talks to his disciples about this mission that is coming to Jerusalem. Peter, when asked who Jesus is, proclaims, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And then Jesus tells the disciples, what's going to happen to him, that he'll suffer and die and rise to life. And Peter, as the speaker for the disciple, says, oh, God will never let that happen. And that's when Jesus says, Satan, get away from me. You are in my way. You have no idea how God works. And it's six days after that, that James and Peter and John have that mountaintop experience with Jesus, with a voice 
coming from a cloud that says, this is my son, my beloved, in whom I am well pleased. And these are the same words that were used at Jesus' bap baptism in the Jordan River, except are added these words, listen to him. We began our season with a supernatural kind of story of the foreign wise men following a star to worship the Messiah who's just been born. And we ended with a mystical experience of this baby who's now a man whose face shines like the sun with the presence of Moses and Elijah and a voice from a cloud. Now, we know it's going to happen to Jesus. We know it's not intended that he will continue to walk with the disciples for years to come, gathering people to follow him, that he will continue to give wonderful sermons on the mount. What is to come could be entitled the empire strikes back. For Jesus and his disciples will go to Jerusalem. Jesus, of course, will be arrested, hung on a cross. Trauma and grief will abound. And then comes another transition where Jesus' death is not the end of the story. Now, transitions are part of all our lives. Elaine, Forrest, and I, we were talking this week, and we happened to be reading the same book called Light is in the Transition, Mastering Change at Any Age by a man named Bruce Filer, who's just a wonderful writer. And in this book, Filer says that life is not linear and the world at this time does not adhere to the predictable as if it ever did, but it has chaos and complexity. And instead of a linear line in life, there are loops, and wobbles and spirals and twists and tangles and turnabouts. Now, I think that's an interesting metaphor. For the story of Jesus from birth to baptism, to teaching, to transfiguration, healing, arrest, death and across, resurrection, it's not a linear story, it's, it's anything but. In fact, the resurrection is one big turnabout and twist that's never expected in one's life. Filer's book, tells the story of about 40 people whose lives appear to be over through decades of being beaten down or told that their illness will kill them. And these 40 people all kind of recreate and relaunch their lives, even if as they relaunch, they are facing death, but they all manage a big change in their life. At the end of the book, the author tells about and quotes a song by Garth Brooks called The River. Even though we can't control the river, even though life is ever flowing, ever changing, ever threatening, ever maddening, we must choose to chance the rapids. We had church council this past week and we talked about transitions, which we've been doing in the past months. And it is right that we do so. Spoken about, of course, was the challenge of transitions and the grief that the congregation has gone through in recent years, COVID, of course, the loss of the presence of some members and friends, Nancy's retirement. We also acknowledge the uncertainty and the anxiety going on right now. Gordon Rankin spoke last week about the few candidates available for pastoral positions, especially part-time positions. And so we wonder, well, will we be able to find pastor? And we know life does not have predictability. Reverend Rankin said probably five, 10 years ago, a congregation could predict that the search for a pastor would conclude with a settled pastor. We don't know if that's exactly the case right now. So there's other models of pastoral leadership being thought of. And a lot is being written about this in the United Church of Christ and beyond in the mainline congregations in the United States you know all this. In a conversation I had with Gordon Rankin this week, he asked about how many people average do you have in worship? And I said, I think as I looked at the numbers last year's attendance were between 30 and 35. And he said 60% of the churches in the New Hampshire Conference of the United Church of Christ have less than 30 people in worship. He added, you are not a small church. Now I know the question of money comes up. We don't have the money to do what we want to do. Our income is less 
than the expenses that we budgeted for, and that makes people nervous. And questions like, well, what will we do? How long can we go on like this? So I'm saying we're in a time of transition, and no doubt something will change. Maybe something like giving up a half-time pastor. But you know what I see at this congregation? What I see in it, even with all these questions and some questions and anxieties and what will happen in the future, what I see is vital life and energy. Do you recall a couple of weeks ago, I preached about this spark? Remember that story in Isaiah 49, the servant fails at a simple thing and God calls the servant to be a light to the ends of the earth. Our congregation was called to be a spark and it is sparking. Our congregation, Gordon Rankin told me, is known to be one of the sparkiest in the New Hampshire conference. Gordon said that to me in a conversation this week. He said, you know, that congr your congregation is a star. And I said, I have seen it. Thinking back to that non-linear line of life, as a congregation, our story is not linear. It has not been linear since it was organized in 1820. Consider the transition from summer church to year-round church. And then in the first 10 years of being year-round, you had a part-time pastor, then you had two pastors, then you had an intro. You were forming and shifting in new and unexpected ways. And then with Nancy, you were in your prime with younger families and kids galore and energy abounded. And then something shifted, COVID arrived, Nancy retired. I think since 2020, the church has wobbled a bit, but that spark has always been there. And in recent months, I've seen even more spark emerging. But people will say, but the income, the income's not coming back. Will it come back? I can't predict. As I said, I do wonder if our present financial mission and ministry, that is the way we prioritize our current expenses, will be coming to an end. And if that's the case, it will look different. And I don't know what it will look like. I don't know what will change or if there might be something lost. Again, no prediction. But I know one thing that will not be lost, and that's the spark. However, we are looking at a change, a transition, a shift in our mindset while we observe and take inventory of our resources, financial energy, time, and gifts. Remember, it only takes a spark to get a fire going. Where are our sparks that are strong that will keep fires going? I think we're called to fan the sparks of creativity and flexibility, which I know we have. I spoke with counsel about trying new things while I'm here, and I've set up with Renee Rouse and Northwood a service on March 12th. Renee Rouse is the pastor in Northwood, and so physically she will be present in Northwood, and we'll see her on the screens. It's just another way to worship, and I know we have enough flexibility to try it for a Sunday, and then there'll be an opportunity to reflect upon the experience later in March. The event of the transfiguration gave encouragement and strength to Peter and James and John to help them face the events that were to come, events that twisted and tangled and then did a turnabout from death to life. In a visit with B. Nelson, who's been a member of this church for many decades, who saw the church from its transition from summer church to year round church, she said, I know this church is gonna be there for many years. There are epiphanies in this congregation that have occurred that have provided strength and encouragement to the congregation in this journey. I know that God's presence is known here and that the spark is a manifestation of God's spirit and that we are to keep that spark going. Amen. And may these words preached in God's name give God glory and honor. We are all
As we come to our prayers this morning, you see Deb Linneberry online, and Deb had surgery this past week, and she came through it really well. And the next morning, she was actually up and walking with her walker and made coffee for herself. So she's done real well and really very glad to see her. And also, I need to let you know that Laura and Bill's daughter-in-law, Sandy, died yesterday. And we give thanks that she is now at peace. And we pray for their family and their son, Scott, as he manages all the things now that he needs to manage after Sandy's death. So God of glory, hear our prayers. Are there other prayers to share in the community this morning? Charlie. <laughs> Prayers for Cheryl Richardson. Laura's having very significant problems with the hips. Prayers for Cheryl Richardson, who is having some health challenges. Her hips are really bothering her. So, God of glory, hear our prayers for the healing. Let us take some moments of quiet for you to share with God anything or anyone else upon your own hearts. Let us pray. God of transfiguration, you meet us in the ordinary and the extraordinary moments of life. We seek you where we live, whether it is near the lakes or the city. We also seek experiences on mountaintops with views of the world that fill us with wonder. We acknowledge that at times we feel overwhelmed in the valleys of life by what we see or hear, by the complexities of living that overwhelm us by others' troubles that immobilize us and keep us from acting. Remembering the experiences of wonder and illumination that we have had, knowing in our souls that you are always with us, may we feel freer to love and serve, relying upon your grace to give us what we need, relying upon your wisdom to help us figure out when is the right time, where is the right place to act, speak, and be present. We are grateful that we can be here this morning. We are not entitled to the warmth and safety of this place, yet we receive it. We are mindful of all the people who have inadequate shelter, those in Turkey and Syria who are living outside, others who are living in refugee camps and all who are unsheltered. May our gratefulness for what we've received extend toward generosity toward others. We pray for all those affected by and involved in the recent train disaster in Ohio. May those who are managing this crisis think clearly and may their decisions protect and restore life in every form. For the safety of all, we pray. It has been a year since Russia invaded Ukraine. We cry out for peace there. God of restoration. We scream at the daily mass shootings and increasing violence and death by guns in this country. We are in the middle of our laments and unable to see a way out. Help us. 
grant to all of your presence of love. Let us show our love to others. And in all we do, may you be glorified, O God. As those who follow Jesus, we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. With joy, we offer our gifts to God as a sign of our devotion and our faithfulness. Transform us as you transfigured stood upon on tables high. Lead us up our sacred mountains, search us with revealing light. Lift us from where we together our prayer of dedication in the table. <clears throat> God of mountains and valleys, be thou our vision. We faithfully add our gifts to those given all around us. Bless these offerings that they may be transfigured into your presence in the world. Amen. Oh, my best Lord. 
God has been revealed to us that we might follow and transform the world. Go in love, work in peace. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God's face turn towards you and give you peace. Amen. We'd like to thank our uh, reader today, Ann Killier, graphic design and production by Emily. This week we have a full week. We have meditation on Tuesday evening at 5 p.m. in our Zoom uh, church Zoom room. And uh, Wednesday will be the Ash Wednesday says a service at 7 p.m. here in the sanctuary. And I will um, put it on our Zoom room as well. If you're unable to make it to the sanctuary, you can join us that way. We have Thursday evening at uh, 5 p.m. more meditation with Joanne White. Uh, on Friday evening is the, uh, it'll actually be the second night of production of Greece School Edition at the Pittsfield Players. And a, a bunch of people from church are planning to go. Um, but they also have opening night on Thursday evening, and they have another show on Saturday evening. And Ann Killinger is in it, uh, Brent Bemis, and Luca G. Pellegrini right next to J. Sorry, Luca J. Pellegrini. I know he likes the initial in his name. Um, so everybody that can make it out and see a bunch of people uh, of our young kids in that production uh, it will be a nice time. And then we have Sunday worship uh, at our normal 10 a.m. It actually says Rebecca Massini, but Rebecca's going to be away and it's going to be Jeff that is going to be talking with us about thin places. There's a little plug and we'll pass that off to him in a moment. But uh, little notes on announcements is that Prepared to Serve Conference will be on uh, Saturday, uh, February 25th at the Pembroke Academy. Um, I will now explain my little bit of boss knot day. I grew up um, down in Maryland, and my grandmother on my dad's side was Pennsylvania Dutch, and she always did boss knot day. And boss knot day, she would make donuts. They were a potato-based donut, and then she would use all the lard out of the kitchen to cook the donuts in, and that was to get the lard out of the house before Lent. So that you would use it during Lent. And so we always got donuts made by Grandma Bloom uh, on uh, Fat Tuesday. And so then a, a few years back, Nancy started to bring the tradition of Shrove Tuesday, um, which is a pancake Sunday or pancake Tuesday, but she shifted it to being Sunday, the Sunday before Lent. And so we started that tradition and we would have pancakes. So hence why I decided to uh, bring pancake batter and uh, make pancakes here for everybody today. And again, I, I did say I have regular pancake batter and I have gluten free that is also dairy free as well. Um, and next week, Jeff Scott will be preaching and leading worship. And um, just a reminder to be sure to email in your thin places, images, and stories to share. And I will pass the microphone to another announcement. I don't know if Jeff wants to speak first on that. And then Tuesday, is a search committee meeting. Tuesday at 3 p.m. will be the search committee meeting. morning again. Hey, I just wanted to say, Rebecca, I'm so envious of people, preachers that can conclude a service in, what, 50 minutes? We're already announcements. Well, I'm going to see if I can change that next week. <laughs> Your economy of words is always effective, and I, I really wrote down a bunch of things today. You know, you're talking about, not to elaborate on, on the sermon, but uh, this church has wobbled a little bit, you said, but and I've only been here a while, but Remember the weevils? 
What's the expression? Weevils squabble. This is vision statement for you right there. Um, anyway, just uh, again, I'm reminded of Transfiguration Sunday that your thin places can be on your mountaintop or your valleys, times of celebration, times of loss. I'm reminded, um, by the way, a little thin place <laughs> in the locker room at the YMCA, I met um, Edward Bruderman's uh, son. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Don. Yeah. Don. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Baltimore. Baltimore. Yeah. Baltimore. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Edward's yeah. son. Yeah. And uh, we got talking, but I'm reminded of Walter Brueger and said that uh, you know our lives indeed tend to be like the Hebrew cycles of history versus linear, but also he spoke of break points in our lives, and that's where you sometimes find your thin places already in your break points. So again, just a, a plug to please send in your photos. You don't want to listen to me the whole time. I saw an article this week in the Pittsfield Post that um, over the moon is so popular that we need reservations. So anybody um, who would like to have dinner before we go to Greece, if you haven't spoken to me, please do today, because I'm going to put the reservation in this afternoon. And for people who aren't going to dinner and want their own tickets, um, I have brought the tickets. And they're not reserved, but Emily's an usher, and she's going to put a bunch of coats or strings or something on a bunch of seats and, and keep us together. So, so that's coming up. So it's up here. It's just me after. Any other announcements? Yeah. And just add to Emily's announcement about prepared to serve. It prepared to serve is closing with the um, installation of our new associate conference minister. And so if you're at prepared to serve, please plan to stay for that. That will be a special time in the life of our new yeah. Uh, it, I'm supposed to ask who's going. Is any is anyone going? I I will be there. Yeah. Going? There's a high word workshop. I was just thinking of workshops that would be helpful for us to cover. I'm going to do the one on um, shared pastorships, but there's also a hybrid one that if somebody had space in the their day, it would be nice to cover. Amen.